In the shadow of the Little Bighorn River, a horrific chapter of American history unfolded on June 25, 1876, marked by confusion, chaos, and the tragic last stand of General George Custer and his men. In this gripping eyewitness account, we delve into the harrowing experiences of those who witnessed Custer's final moments, revealing the shocking truths that have long been obscured by time and myth. As soldiers like George Herendine and John Berkman faced the relentless onslaught of Native American warriors, they grappled with not only the brutal reality of battle, but also the chilling uncertainty of their leader's fate. With the river sparkling just out of reach, the men were parched and desperate, their thirst driving them to unimaginable lengths. The haunting sounds of war echoed around them, screams, gunfire, and the distant wails of mourning Indians, creating a surreal backdrop to their struggle for survival. Through their eyes, we uncover the dark secrets of that fateful day, the cowardice displayed by some, the bravery of others, and the eerie silence that followed the chaos. What truly happened during Custer's last stand? Why did so many brave men fall? And what were the decisions that led to their demise? Join us as we reveal the horrific truths and shocking details that never made sense about Custer's last stand, brought to life through the vivid accounts of those who lived to tell the tale. But before we begin, be sure to like and subscribe to our channel to support our community. We left the Rosebud on June 22nd at noon. We marched up the Rosebud for about 12 miles and set up camp for the night. The next morning, on June 23rd, we broke camp at 5 o'clock and continued up the Rosebud until 9 o'clock. There, we found a large lodge pole trail that was about 10 days old. We followed this trail along the Rosebud until evening when we set up camp on the trail. On the morning of June 24th, we left at 5 o'clock and followed the trail for 5 or 6 miles. We then met six Crow Indian scouts who had been sent out the night before by General Custer to search for the Indian village. They told us they had found fresh pony tracks and that the trail was fresher about 10 miles ahead. General Custer called the officers together, but I didn't hear what he said to them. The scouts were sent ahead again and moved quickly. We started moving at one o'clock. While the officers were having their lunch, the scouts returned and reported that they had discovered where the village had been recently. They moved out again with flankers spread out to watch the trail and make sure it didn't split. Around four o'clock, we reached the spot where the village had been just a few days earlier and set up camp two miles below the forks of the Rosebud. The scouts went out again to search for the village and at 11 o'clock that night, Custer had everything packed up and followed the scouts up the right fork of the Rosebud. At dawn, we set up camp, made coffee, and shortly after daybreak, the scouts informed Custer that they had spotted the village from the top of the divide, separating the Rosebud from the Little Horn River. We moved up the creek until we were close to its source and concealed ourselves in a ravine. It was about three miles from where we were hiding to the top of the divide where the scouts claimed they could see the Indian camp. After hiding his troops, General Custer, along with a few orderlies, galloped ahead to take a look at the village. Around an hour later, Custer returned and said he couldn't see the village, but the scouts and a half-breed guide named Nuck Bayer insisted they could clearly see it about 15 miles away. While Custer was searching for the village, the scouts came back and reported that he had been discovered and that news was spreading to the village that he was approaching. Another scout mentioned that two Sioux war parties had crept up and seen our command, and fresh pony tracks were found in a nearby ravine. Custer then called for the officers, gave his orders, and prepared the troops for battle. The scouts were sent ahead, and the regiment moved forward at a slow pace. After traveling about three miles, the scouts reported that Indians were ahead, and we followed the trail. Our path went down a small creek, a branch of the Little Horn, and after around six miles, we discovered an Indian lodge in front of us. 
Custer approached it at a brisk trot. When we arrived, we found a recently abandoned Indian camp. All the lodges were gone except the one we encountered, which contained a dead Indian. From this spot, we could see into the Little Horn Valley and noticed large clouds of dust rising about five miles away. Many believed the Indians were retreating, and I think General Custer thought so too, as he sent a message to Colonel Reno, who was ahead with three companies of the 7th Regiment to quickly push the scouts toward the dust. Reno galloped down the creek bottom for three miles to where it met the Little Horn and found a natural ford across the river. He started to cross when the scouts called out to him to wait, saying that a large number of Sioux were coming to meet him. However, Reno crossed over, formed his companies on the prairie in a battle line, and moved forward at a trot, soon breaking into a gallop. The valley was about three-fourths of a mile wide, with a line of low hills on the left and the river bottom filled with cottonwood trees and bushes on the right. After some scattered shots were fired from the hills and the river bottom, Reno's skirmishers returned fire. He advanced about a mile from the ford to a line of trees on the right and dismounted the men to fight on foot. The horses were sent into the trees and the soldiers formed on the prairie to advance toward the Indians. The Indians, mounted on ponies, charged across the prairie and opened heavy fire on the soldiers. After skirmishing for a few minutes, Reno fell back to his horses in the trees. The Indians moved to his left and rear, clearly intending to cut him off from the ford. Reno ordered his men to mount and move through the trees. Just as the men got into the saddle, the Sioux, who had advanced in the trees, fired at close range, killing one soldier. Colonel Reno then commanded the men to dismount, but he soon ordered them to mount again and moved out onto the open prairie. The command headed for the ford, closely pursued by a large number of Indians, and at every moment the speed increased until it became a full run for the ford. The Sioux, on their swift ponies, raced alongside the soldiers and fired at them, killing both men and horses. There was little resistance, and it was a complete route to the ford. I did not see the men at the ford and do not know what happened, but I know many were killed when the command left the trees. Just as I got out, my horse stumbled and fell, throwing me off, and it ran away after Reno's command. I saw several soldiers who were dismounted because their horses had been killed or had run off. There were also some soldiers still mounted who had stayed behind. I think there were about 13 soldiers, and seeing no chance to escape, I called on them to come into the trees with me to hold off the Indians. Three of the soldiers were wounded, two of them so badly they couldn't use their arms. The soldiers wanted to go out, but I said no. We couldn't reach the ford, and we had to stay with the wounded. The soldiers still wanted to leave, but I told them I was an old frontiersman, understood Indians, and if they followed my advice, I would get them out of this situation, which was no worse than scrapes I had been in before. About half of the men were mounted and wanted to keep their horses, but I told them to let the horses go and fight on foot. We stayed in the bushes for about three hours, and I could hear heavy firing down by the river, apparently about two miles away. I didn't know who was fighting, but I knew the Indians were engaging some of our men and later learned it was Custer's command. Almost all the Indians in the upper valley moved down the river, and the fight with Custer lasted about an hour before the heavy firing stopped. When the shooting began to fade, I said to the boys, come on, now is the time to get out. Most of them didn't leave, but waited for night. I warned them the Indians would return and we should leave immediately. Eleven of the thirteen soldiers said they would go, but two stayed behind. I deployed the men as skirmishers and we moved forward on foot toward the river. When we had nearly reached the river, we encountered five Indians on ponies who fired at us. I returned the fire, causing the Indians to retreat, and we forded the river, which was breast deep. We finally got over, wounded men and all, and headed for Reno's command, which I could see drawn up on the bluffs along the river about a mile away. We reached Reno safely. We had not been with Reno more than 15 minutes 
when I saw the Indians coming up the valley from Custer's fight. Reno was then moving his entire command down the ridge toward Custer. The Indians crossed the river below Reno and swarmed up the bluffs on all sides. After skirmishing with them, Reno returned to his original position, which was on one of the highest points along the bluffs. It was now about five o'clock and the fight lasted until it was too dark to see clearly. As soon as it was dark, Reno removed the packs and saddles from the mules and horses and used them to create breastworks. He also dragged dead horses and mules into position to provide cover for the men, some of whom dug rifle pits with their knives while all slept with their weapons ready. At the first light of day, the Indians opened heavy fire and a desperate fight ensued, lasting until 10 o'clock. The Indians charged our position three or four times, coming close enough to hit our men with stones thrown by hand. Captain Benteen noticed a large group of Indians gathering to charge and ordered his men to charge on foot and scatter them. Benteen led the charge, surprising the Indians before they knew what was happening and killed many. They were clearly taken aback by this offensive move, and I believe Benteen displayed incredible bravery in the heat of battle. The whole time, he moved among the bullets, encouraging the soldiers to stand firm and not let the Indians defeat them. I should mention that around 10 o'clock, shortly after Benteen's charge, the men began urgently asking for water. Many hadn't had any for 36 hours, and the fighting and hot sun had parched their throats. Some had swollen tongues and could hardly speak. The men tried to eat crackers and hardtack, but couldn't produce enough saliva to moisten them. Several tried chewing grass, but it stuck to their lips, and not one could spit or speak clearly. The wounded were reported to be dying from lack of water, and a good number of soldiers volunteered to go to the river, even if it meant sacrificing themselves. We were fighting on the bluffs about 700 yards from the river, with a ravine leading down from the battlefield close to the water's edge. The men had to run across an open space of about 100 yards to reach the head of the ravine, and this area was under fire from the Indians on the bluffs. Around 50 soldiers dashed over the open ground and entered the ravine. They rushed down to the mouth and found it guarded by Indians posted in the timber across the river. The water could be approached to within about 30 feet under cover, but then one had to step out on the riverbank and face the Indians' fire. The soldiers ran the gauntlet bravely. Some would dash down to the river with camp kettles, fill them, and then take shelter in the bend of the ravine behind the rocks, where canteens were filled and carried up the hill. Before all the men and wounded were supplied, one soldier was killed and six or seven wounded in the desperate attempt. One man had the bone of his leg shattered by a bullet, which later had to be amputated. About two o'clock, the Indians began to pull back, but they continued skirmishing until late in the afternoon, and by nightfall, they had all withdrawn. We were finally able to get water for the animals, many of which were nearly dead, and we let them graze on the hillside. In the evening, Colonel Reno changed his position and fortified the new site, which was higher and stronger than the previous one. We expected the Indians would attack again the next day, but in the morning, there were no Indians to be found. Everyone felt sure that Crook or Terry was coming to help us, and Colonel Reno sent out runners. Around 10 o'clock, we received the joyful news that General Terry, with a large group of troops, was moving up the valley six miles away, and soon the head of his column came into view. In response to questions, Mr. Hayndon said, I went in with the scouts on the left side of Reno's line. There were about 60 of us, with 35 being re-Indians, six friendly Sioux, six Crows, and the rest white men. I saw Bloody Knife, a re-scout, raise his arm and fall over, and I believe he was killed. The two cavalry soldiers I left in the timber when I went out were likely killed, as they have not been seen since. I saw Lieutenant McIntosh shortly after he fell. His horse was shot out from under him early in the fight, and when he was killed, he was riding a soldier's horse. He was shot on the riverbank while trying to return to the ford. I also saw Lieutenant Hodgson. His horse was shot, and he was wounded. 
His horse fell into the river near the opposite bank of the ford, and to help himself up the steep bank, Hodgson grabbed a horse's tail. He had just gotten up the bank when an Indian sharpshooter shot him. Custer's packs were with the others, and the Indians did not manage to take any of them. They also did not get any mules. Most of Custer's horses were shot during the fight, and I don't believe the Indians captured more than 100 animals as a result. I think some of our men were captured alive and tortured. I know the colored scout Isaiah Dorman was, as he had small bullet wounds in his legs from the knees down, and I believe they were shot into him while he was still alive. Another man had strips of skin cut from his body. Many squaws and old gray-haired Indians roamed the battlefield, howling like mad. The squaws had stone mallets and smashed the skulls of the dead and wounded. Many were cut with knives, and some had their noses and other body parts removed. The heads of four white soldiers were found in the Sioux camp, severed from their bodies, but the bodies could not be found on the battlefield or in the village. Our men did not kill any squaws, but the Rhea scouts did. The bodies of six squaws were found in a small ravine. I estimate the Indian village had about 6,000 people, with at least 3,000 being warriors. The Indians fought Reno first and then went to engage Custer, returning afterward to finish off Reno. The same Indians were involved in all the attacks. I believe the Indians were led by Sitting Bull himself, along with eight or nine other chiefs. I saw five chiefs and each carried a flag for their men to rally around. Some flags were red, others yellow, white, blue, and one was black. All the chiefs managed their warriors excellently. I think Crazy Horse and his band were also part of the fight. The Indians likely lost as many men and killed and wounded as the whites did. Custer's men fought bravely and undoubtedly killed many Indians. I don't think a single man escaped from Custer's side of the field. They were completely surrounded on all sides by at least 2,500 warriors. Scout George Herendine. The men got scared from the coward Reno and acted accordingly. Dan Neely, he's living in Gilt Edge, Montana now, has been known as Cracker Box Dan all these years because during the fight, he hid behind a cracker box. Captain Miles Moreland, I heard he was buried in Los Angeles a while back, was called Aparejo Mickey because he spent all his time lying behind an Aparejo. Then there was young Billy Blake, a private. For two days up there, he pretended to be wounded and laid with the injured so he wouldn't have to fight, even though he wasn't hurt at all. After it was over and he came to his senses, Poor Billy was ashamed of himself. He couldn't take the teasing he got from the rest of us, so he got transferred to another company. Now, Billy, Cracker Box, Dan, and Moreland were brave men, natural good soldiers, but the skirmish they went through down below with Reno, who was completely out of his mind with fear yelling orders they couldn't hear, and the panicky retreat up the hill kind of made them act crazy for a while. They were like riderless horses in a fire. Bud, while I was working in the awful heat, dragging dead horses to make breastworks and firing down at the Indians, I kept wondering, where was Custer? And the men working with me kept saying, what do you think happened to Custer? Some of them said maybe he had gone to join Terry, but most of us knew better than that. We knew he wouldn't leave us in trouble because that wasn't his way, and along with the heat and the constant craving for water was the worry about Custer. At first, while we worked early on the 25th, we could see a lot of smoke and dust across on the other ridge. It was just a little ways off, bud. About then, most of the Indians left us and went in that direction. If we'd followed them, if we'd attacked their rear instead of letting them gather again against Custer, maybe he'd still be alive today. But we didn't. We stayed hidden behind the rifle pits. We heard some shots fired from over there. Someone spoke up and laughed, saying, I reckon Custer's giving the Red Devils hell. We kept listening. We heard a volley fired, and then, after a minute, another. Folks figure now that was Custer's signal of distress, his last call for us to come to him. If we'd walked just a little ways, just up to the next ridge, we could have seen down onto Custer Hill. But we didn't. 
Then, after a while, there were no more shots from over there, and the smoke cleared away, and the dust settled. I don't know if I can tell things in regular order, bud. It's a long time to remember back, and even then, with the firing, the heat, the thirst for water, and our worry about Custer, along with the yelling, shooting, and riding Indians down below, we were all confused. But pretty soon, Wallace came back up the hill, and he was beaten. There weren't many of his men left with him. The rest had been killed down in the brush, trying to get through to Custer. But those men shouldn't be pitied. They died like soldiers. I'd rather be one of them than live on branded a coward. Don't get me wrong, bud. We want all cowards. A lot of bravery was shown that day. Some men volunteered to go down, right in the face of Indian fire, to rescue the wounded who were scattered along the side of the cliff. We were all craving water. The wounded suffered the most. Dr. Porter, he was a good one and a brave fellow, worked tirelessly to ease the suffering as best he could. With the heat, blood poisoning set in quickly. I saw him one time in particular amputate a man's leg. I saw the man lying there, his face as white as a sheet, his lips tight, not a moan out of him, just his eyes showing how much it hurt. Dr. Porter said, my wounded need water. Who'll volunteer to go get it? Mm, but there was the river just below us, millions of gallons of water rippling and sparkling along. But between us and it were the Indians, shooting anyone who tried to get to it. A deep ravine led from our hill, and men could crawl down through it almost to the river. But then there was a short stretch of open ground, and to dash across it for a drink meant certain death. Our craving for a drink got terrible. We sucked on raw potatoes and held pebbles in our mouths, but nothing helped much. We would have all sold our souls for a drink of that water we could see flowing. But the wounded, of course, were in the worst situation. When Dr. Porter spoke up, some men volunteered and crept down the ravine carrying buckets, kettles, and canteens. I started with them, but my horse got hit in the flank, and I came back, figuring I'd just as soon die of thirst as from an Indian bullet. Some of them made it. One fellow was hit just as he bent over to fill his bucket, and the pail was shot away, shattering his leg. He held on to another fellow's stirrup and was dragged back up the hill. Later, that leg had to be amputated. Most of those who went down brought back a little water, just enough for the doctor to trickle into the mouths of the wounded. After that, from time to time, men kept slipping down through the ravine to the river, but I didn't try it again. I saw Dandy shot in the neck. I don't recall who was riding him. I saw him fall. He was a pretty little horse, dark brown. He never could stand to have any other horse ahead of him. Custer got him in 68, and I thought, the general will feel pretty bad when I tell him Dandy was killed. I remembered him saying, just as we left Fort Lincoln, that he'd have to get another horse because Dandy was starting to show his age a bit. He lay there, just like he was sleeping, and I thought of all the good times he and Custer had galloping across the plains, and tears came to my eyes while I stroked his neck. Then he opened his eyes, big and soft and suffering, and he gave a little nicker. I knew he was begging for water, wondering why I didn't take care of him like always. Well, the long, hot day dragged on. It felt like a year to us up there, not knowing where Custer was, and not knowing what minute the Indians would charge us from the rear, where they had no cliffs for protection. Thinking back on it now, bud, it all seems like a bad dream, like it couldn't have happened. I keep thinking, maybe it is a dream. Maybe after a while I'll wake up and I won't be old, and I'll be back with the seventh, tending to Blush and Tuck and Vic and Dandy, and Miss Libby will be there, and the General will be around, laughing and joking, wearing his big white hat, just like always. But the bad dream won't ever end, I know, until I get the guts to end it. All during the 25th and 6th, while the Indians down below were firing up at us, there was a fellow on a hill overlooking ours who kept popping down at us with a long-range buffalo gun. He was a good shot. We couldn't see him, but every time his gun fired, one of our men, or a horse or a mule, dropped. That Indian did more to annoy us than all the others down below. 
Toward the end, Captain Ryan got him with a long-range gun. After the fight, I went over to the hill and saw him lying there, the buffalo gun still in his hand, behind some boulders he had piled up for breastworks. Long toward night of the first day, the 25th. The smoke cleared a bit in the valley and most of the Indians started to dwindle away, heading back to their village for a spell of resting and mourning for their dead, leaving just enough warriors around to keep us up there on the hill. None of us had eaten since leaving camp with Custer early that day. We chewed on hard tack and raw bacon, but the food felt like hay scratching down our dry throats with no water. We were all pretty much worn out. A lot of the men just dropped in their tracks and went to sleep, too tired to care what happened next. I was one of those detailed to do night guard. I had to guard Reno's tent. He had a keg in there and was drinking quite a bit. I couldn't see inside, but I could hear. Once, as I was marching past, I heard him say to another officer with him, Well, he said, I wonder where the Murat of the American Army is by this time. And then I heard them both laugh. I never knew what Murat meant, but I knew he was talking about Custer, and I could tell there was a sneer in his laugh. It was dark. I kept marching back and forth in front of his tent. Here and there on the ground were spots where men were stretched out, sleeping, and there were other dark spots, bodies of dead horses and dead men. It got really quiet. Down in the valley where all day there had been fire and smoke, screaming horses and yelling Indians, it was dark and still. From far away came the beat of tom-toms and the wailing of Indians mourning for their dead. The only other sound was the rustle of cottonwoods and the swish of the river. Every little while I'd stop marching back and forth and listen, thinking I heard low voices and the crunch of horses' feet, thinking maybe it was Custer and his men creeping up to us through the dark. I kept straining my eyes across toward the ridge where he'd last been seen, and it felt like my whole body ached just to know where he was. But all night nothing happened, and eventually morning broke. By the time the sun came up, the air was still and heavy. We were all on edge, waiting for something to happen. I kept thinking about how we hadn't had any real food or water for so long. The thirst was driving us mad. Some men were mumbling in their sleep, and others were just staring into the darkness, lost in their thoughts. I wished I could see Custer, to know he was all right. Then I remembered Dandy, my horse, and how he had been shot. I thought about how he had always been there for me, and I felt a wave of sadness wash over me. I couldn't shake the feeling that things were only going to get worse. The quiet was unsettling, and I knew we had to be ready for whatever was coming next. I hope this first-hand account gives you a new perspective on the Battle of Little Bighorn and the Great Sioux War of 1876. Stay tuned for more videos like this. I hope to bring you more first-hand accounts of different battles, so have a great day, and I'll see you next time.